are going to have in advancing this idea of healthier buildings, healthier schools, healthier com communities. And it really builds upon the work that you're already doing, uh, you know, with your lead programs, your water, water testing, et cetera. Um, but what I hope to do is to really give you the tools. Um, there's a lot of data coming out about exactly how our buildings are impacting us. You know, we spend so much of our time inside four walls and a roof, um, and the data is really coming a long way to illustrate exactly how that is. And so this might look familiar. <laughs> Uh, the WHO, you know, it, it really is not just an absence of d disease that makes something healthy. Um, it's actually the CDC breaks it down <clears throat> even further to show that I always thought that healthcare, our medical care, or our genetics were the bigger factor into how healthy we were, but in reality, it's actually the physical and social environments that we live in and our lifestyle and our health behaviors that have a bigger impact. So. You guys have the opportunity to be agents of change for health in our communities in ways that maybe we haven't quite thought of before. So the well building standard was created over a five year period of research and peer review. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of professionals, practitioners, doctors, the first to get architects and doctors to, to get into a room and talk to each other. Um, and the um, result of that is the well building standard. We focus on seven concepts, air, water, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, and mind. Uh, and throughout the well building standard, you can actually see which body systems are best impacted by that particular strategy or intervention. Um, so we do take a, a very data driven approach. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my time kind of walking through um, how these seven concepts, you know, apply to schools. Um, schools Children's bodies are not just miniature adult bodies. They actually, um, you know, they, they process things differently. So um, one in 13 school children, you know, have uh, some type of asthma related condition. It's one of the biggest reasons they're, they're often absent from school. Um, and so HVAC and the ventilation rates, the level of filtration you're providing in your schools, whether you use um, operable windows or, or natural ventilation strategies, um, healthy entrances, all of those things are in your purview and why I'm really excited to be here talking to you guys and, and being able to have a dialogue with you guys. Um, a lot of people think that it's just, you know, air, air pollution is outdoors and it's not a problem, but indoor air can often be two to five times more polluted than outdoor air, often from poor ventilation or chemicals we're using in our cleaning products. Um, you know, the particulate matter coming in off of people's shoes or, or dust buildup, mold accumulation. Um, I think mold probably keeps you all up at night, so, you know, you're aware of that. But um, ultimately, in the well building standard, a well certified project would be specifying low VOC materials. They'd have that healthy entrance walk-off mat system, you know, at, at the front of the building. Um, you'd have a, a higher level filtration, a MERV 13 filtration level that maybe you're doing, maybe not doing um, right now. Uh, a very proactive mold um, <clears throat> prevention. Um, Construction pollution management, you know, something you guys might be doing, maybe you'll do more of if you're a well certified or, or pursuing well certification. The water concept of well, I think this is a good example. You guys might be familiar with LEED or other green rating systems um, that focus on energy. And they do intersect nicely in some ways, but this is how, how they're different. In the, lead, in the LEED model, you're thinking about how much water the building's using. In well, we're focused on health exclusively. So it's about what is the quality of the water being delivered to students and to staff. Um, and so, you know, in well, we're thinking about 
access to water, hydration, promotion, uh, you know, uh, the level of contaminants in the water, taste properties even. So uh, it doesn't require filtration, you know, like a whole building filtration system. It's actually performance tested on site. So in order to achieve a well certification, a third party would actually go to the site to conduct on site inspections of things in the space. And in, in one of those would be uh, collecting water samples to see how the building's performing. Um, you know, it, it, it's a pretty critical issue, as you saw with Flint, is you know, a lot of the contaminants um, are unregulated. And um, you know, one flip of a switch and you know, the water supply changes and that's, a, that's a, a bigger headache. So you could choose to you know, add in some filtered water. I think earlier we said the LK systems, you know, those, are, those are really popular. Um, but it's not, you know, so providing fundamental water quality is key, um, but then going a step further and really saying um, you know, possibly filtered water would be a good idea. Um, additionally, uh, you know, because well is focused on health, we want to make sure that those maintenance protocols are in place to make sure that the fountains themselves are, are um, uh, being taken care of. In the nourishment concept of well, this is uh, where I think we have the opportunity to have a significant impact. Um, you know, kids these days, obesity is on the rise, and um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard the term obesogenic environment. Uh, it's an environment that promotes um, high energy intake, high calorie intake, um, but also paired with sedentary behavior. So um, I know some offices are obesogenic environments and, and some schools are certainly obesogenic environments. Um, so it, it's not just a US problem, it's a global problem, this uh, rise in obesity. And I think that kids just have a whole lot of activities nowadays that are sedentary. And so how can we you know, create a, an environment that is um, focused on providing them a better food environment, more, more choice. Um, so using strategic dining design, um, do you have a convenience line where if it, the healthier foods you get through faster? Um, you know, working with the, the food service team to make sure that the portions are appropriate, that, you know, that there's wholesome food options available, um, that any allergies uh, are labeled, possibly even specifying seasonal local um, organic uh, produce when, when possible, um, but it's empowering people to make healthier choices. It's not completely banning um, all unhealthy choices. It's hard to define what that is sometimes, but um, it's really just how do we make it easier and more convenient to make healthier choices. In the light concept of well, um, this is an exciting one for us because um, the science has really evolved uh, quite quickly and lighting designers are um, all, on, all universally agree that our bodies are impacted by light and light could almost be viewed as medicine in some sort of way. So um, this is you know, considered a, the natural circadian rhythm, uh, the way that our, our bodies have evolved over time in relationship to the sun, um, our bodies produce hormones uh, in response to that. So um, at night, you're producing melatonin to prepare your body for sleep. And at morning, um, you're, you're producing cortisol uh, to, to wake up and, and get on with your day. And so um, with well, we want to optimize those spaces. Obviously, number one is the more daylight you can bring into those schools, um, you know, the better you're going to emulate, you know, that natural sleep-wake cycle. But it's not always uh, an option, especially in existing schools. Uh, light retrofits may or may not be in the cards, but um, anything you can do to swap out the bulbs, making sure that they get access to that brighter, bluer light for at least four hours out of a day is going to help you know, it's the, the philosophy is that you would help you stay alert when you need to be alert and sleep better, um, you know, throughout the rest of the time. Um, additionally, in schools, we want to be thinking about electric glare control um, and the screens. Uh, you know, I know a lot of uh, students use laptops nowadays, and so how do we, you know, 
safely, comfortably with the eye, transition from you know, projectors on the wall, screens in front of us, uh, mobility around the space. So working with your architecture teams to think about the lighting conditions um, you know, for that space. Uh, additionally, solar glare coming in, obviously opening up a lot of daylight into a space can, can bring in uh, solar glare issues. So the, the shading, the blinds, or even the electric chromatic glass, that's dynamic glass that, that responds uh, to the sun. Um, and other types of, it doesn't all have to be overhead. So there's a lot of different lighting strategies. You can use supplemental activity-based lighting um, in order to support this. The fitness, um, again, this is another one where um, we think is, it goes back to the sedentary behavior. There's so many options, but um, how many times have we seen recess taken away as a punishment when really kids in their bodies, they need to move. And so we definitely want to encourage, um, uh, you know, all of the physical activity that we can. One way that you can do that is with um, inviting staircases. So really engaging, making sure they're wide enough um, so that you can comfortably pass. Aesthetically pleasing, so it makes you want to, to do that. Um, other ways of designing a space that create that sense of community that um, you know, gets people to, to move more often um, is gonna have a, a really good um, impact and interestingly, we have as a society over time. You know, in the 1900s, we were all dying from infectious diseases mostly, and and now you definitely see heart disease and and cancers and um, you know non-infectious diseases. And so, um, it's about creating a culture of health. It's um, really a unifying principle. Um, I think in this case is. Um, you know, thinking about uh, the administration, thinking about uh, teachers and instructors uh, and students being able to, to move throughout the space. What type of activity incentive programs um, can you put in place to, to do that, um, you know, on the campus? How, you know, how can we support um, the recreation facilities on that, the pedestrian amenities. Um, so if you have that bench or make it, you know, make the uh, the campus uh, more pedestrian friendly, um, you're definitely going to see a lot more movement on the space. Um, safety, another big concern in terms of pedestrian amenities, people um, dropping off, picking up the buses, etc. So uh, pedestrian safety would be a big part of fitness in a well-certified building. Uh, comfort. So this is um, uh, where we find acoustic comfort uh, being a big challenge. Uh, younger children, uh, they have an underdeveloped sense of hearing, and so they're more dramatically impacted by uh, uncomfortable acoustic environments. Um, but I think acoustics is one that we have a lot of budget-friendly, a whole variety of, of acoustic solutions. So if your focus is on health and well-being for your project, um, you can obviously think about exterior noise intrusion, where's the building located, and how can we uh, mitigate you know, the noise coming inside from outside. Where's the noisy equipment in my space? Um, the mechanical system, where is, you know, is there an elevator, possibly a loading dock? Um, where are all those spaces in relation to concentration zones or, or, or classroom um, studios? So really being more conscious as you plan, um, you know, how to create a more comfortable acoustic environment. Uh, for students is a, is a pretty big um, factor, as well as thermal comfort. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go into somebody being uh, more thermally comfort, but who said, you know, if you, a student is in a 90 degree classroom or a 70 de degree classroom, you're going to see a difference in how the student reacts. And, um, you know, so obviously as facilities, you, you know, that's one of the biggest things. I'm, I'm too hot, I'm too cold, I'm too hot, I'm too cold. Um, so with well, it's um, trying to build a more responsive, a more proactive approach to establishing that thermal comfort. Um, in the comfort concept of well, um, we're also thinking about um, 
accessibility, making sure, I know that ADA retrofits are a pretty big deal, but um, a well-certified school would be ADA compliant um, and make sure that everyone can safely, comfortably access the school. And optional things like olfactory comfort, um, trying to isolate those unwanted smells um, from places and, and being a distraction from, from others. So are there um, you know, labs or programs or uh, cafeteria um, potentially that, that you could isolate some of those smells so they're not distracting uh, in a work, uh, work space? Um, lastly, the, the mind concept of well. This is one that I think is pretty key to me is um, we've lost that human nature connection. So biophilia is that, that love of nature and that connection to nature. And um, you know we're getting to a, a place where some urban kids don't even really know and they're like afraid of um, nature. They're biophobic. And um, so pe kids need nature. They need access to, to green spaces. And I know that you know to have that green space costs more because it has to be maintained, it has to be watered, and it has to, you have to have the right pesticides to, to, to care for it. But um, you know, a well-certified space would um, you know, definitely put a lot of focus um, on how much human nature interaction there, there is. Um, the example of that, um, the green wall, obviously not a requirement formally, but um, an option to incorporate live uh, plants within a school, uh, water features uh, within the campus, um, just to encourage people to to have views to nature, to engage in nature uh, in whatever ways you can. Is it um, mental health and well-being, our cognitive and emotional health? It's complex, so there are policy-based things that, that you'd want a, a well-certified school uh, to look after, uh, making sure that um, there are stress programs, that there's um, um, you know, the uh, staff have access to, you know, good health benefits, that there's more community engagement and transparency um, among the staff, students, and, and the, the process. So um, in well, one of the things that is required is an integrative design process. So definitely the, what you described of bringing the community in. Um, and when health and well-being is the focus, I think it's a unifying principle. So everyone at the table, all these stakeholders have different needs and, and different demands. But I think uh, the narrative of health and well-being of the, the students, the staff, um, it, it's a you know, unifying thing where if you can harness all of these health impacts, I think it can be really beneficial to you as you move forward um, to try and advance these, you know, champion these is, you know, the, the data is there, it's, it's coming along and, you know, if you have really ambitious um, health and well-being goals, I encourage you to consider well certification. It's a, you know, a way to actually have a third party come to the school to test the acoustics levels, test the lighting levels, um, you know, trust but verify, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a benchmarking tool, it's, schools are, are, are delivered in a lot of different ways around the world and there's, there's still flexibility in the well building standard in this program so that you can propose to do it differently than we wrote but meeting the same intent, um, you know, we want to be partners in that but ultimately we want, you know, we want to know how building is actually performing, not how you intended, how the master plan was, um, how people are actually doing it, you know, uh, post-occupancy surveys and engagement, you know, after time. Well certification is only valid for three years. In three years, you would need to be retested. Um, so those are the type of ways that you can stay engaged and account uh, accountable, but it's also, you know, a way to, you know, maybe say not how do we carve out extra funds from the general fund to make sure that we're able to deliver on this commitment to health and well-being over time? So it sort of elevates the role and the importance of if you want a healthy school, I'm going to need the funds to do that. Um, and so it's a sort of a tool for you to use to really champion you know, the important role that you guys play in delivering those. Um, so we do have um, a credential, the WellAP credential, and it you know, really just signifies that you understand how our built environment impacts 
impacts our human health and um, you know is a credential that you could consider um, and reach out you know let me know I've been pretty quiet over the last you know or the morning because I wanted to save it for now but if you have any questions at all please you know let me know <laughs> thank you thank you